Oh no, the mute. You muted, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. I am now unmuted, I think, I think. Yes. I'm having this weird, um, I'm having an echo and I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from and I muted myself. All right, weird. I think I figured it out. Because you're not echoing on our end. Hi, everybody. Um, I think my YouTube was actually playing at the same time as the audio ah. was playing, which means there's like a two second delay and I could hear everything twice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ink and Paint technical difficulties. It's WWNT live on YouTube. That's what we do here. <laughs> I am happy to be here again tonight on another Monday night with my co-host Ashley Jasmer. Hey. And tonight we have on our illustrious panel, Disney Desi. Salam and good evening, worthy friends. And Emma Cooley. Insert catchphrase here. I'm really excited for this topic. Anyway. <laughs> I'm excited. Like this, I feel like this show is meant for you. So um, <laughs> we are talking about Disney on Broadway. So all of these crazy, magical, huge, uh, elaborate stage productions that Disney has been doing uh, in on Broadway and in touring companies for, gosh, uh, a really long time now. Um, I think Lion King was the first one, correct, that Disney did? I believe so. Mm. I think it was. Yeah. It was either that or Beauty and the Beast. But I, Beauty and the I Beast, was it? I, think, I, I thought Lion King was like, first. I feel like oh, it's what? Lion King, but it was definitely one of the two. 1999, it opened on the West End. So, oh, so did Disney go Broadway. back and do... Oh no, I'm sorry, um, it opened Beast. on Broadway at the New Amsterdam Theater in 1997. Okay. Oh, so it was Beauty and the Beast. We've... Mm -hmm. It was Beauty and the Beast. Okay. Yes. So in for longer than most of us can really remember, Disney has been doing <laughs> Clearly. <shows on> <laughs> Clearly. Whoopsie. And I'm going to sorry. I'm gonna default here on this one. Uh, I'm really serving honestly mostly as sort of discussion facilitator because my experience with Disney on Broadway is incredibly limited. Um, I have literally seen one show on Broadway that Disney has had a hand in and it was exactly two days ago. And it was Winnie the Pooh, the musical. So I will share uh, what that experience was like uh, a little bit later in the show. But I want to start off with you guys because you are far more into this topic than I am. Uh, have you guys kind of share what your Disney and Broadway experiences have been? So I'm going to start with Desi uh, because I feel like we need to end with Emma because hers is probably <laughs> the most extensive. <laughs> I have seen three of the shows. I've seen Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. Of the shows, I would say probably um lion king is my favorite of those three um surprisingly aladdin of the three movies wise is my favorite um but musical wise probably the third of the three but i love them all honestly when is the first time you saw a a disney broadway show Probably in high school. I think I saw Lion King in high school. It might have been college, but I'm pretty sure it was high school I saw Lion King. And um, then I saw Beauty and the Beast. Um, I've, well, I've seen Lion King a couple of different times, but I'm pretty sure the first time was in high school. And then I saw Beauty and the Beast maybe like 10 years ago. And then I saw um, Aladdin more recently. So uh, I want to share this because I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm verifying the Beauty and the Beast. So Beauty and the Beast opened in 1994 and Lion King opened in 97. But this is exciting. Mm -hmm. Did not know this. Um, Walt Disney Theatrical Productions, which was created in 1993 to, uh, and basically was created to produce Beauty and the Beast on Broadway, 
was headed by Ron Logan, a very good uh, good friend of WWNT, who actually just oh, wow. uh, appeared and did a live talk for us at um, at the Golden Jamboree. So, which you I can still wait, check out. I can't believe that. I know of all the things that Ron Logan has talked about for us. Uh, he didn't really talk well, about. Actually, well, we've usually we've had him come it in, more. Yeah, he mentioned it in the in the Golden Jamboree actually, because that's where I learned. Oh, that did he? he had, well, yeah, he did. Oh, but we've only well, was... had him come and talk about like his production work in the park. So I think he kind Parts, of glosses yeah. over the the Broadway productions because he um, we have him focus on things he he did in the parks, but. I mean, that's huge too. He was really big in the stage productions in the park. So it makes sense that he was the first kind of producer of a Disney theatrical production on Broadway. Mm -hmm. That it does. So cool. Ashley, how about you? What is your Disney Broadway experience? <laughs> so I, I have less experience than you, unfortunately. I have no Disney Broadway experience. I have a list of all the ones that I want to see, which is basically all of them um we were actually gonna go try to see lion king when it was last here in atlanta um but we just we couldn't make it work so unfortunately i have not seen any of them but if i had to pick one that i want to see the most um it would probably and it, i don't even know if it's touring or in production or anything or if it's retired but I honestly think hunchback would have been the coolest one to see or is the one i think i would like to see the most looking at the list of all of the um the ones that have that have come out that that would be my pick if i could pick one to see yeah i don't know what i would pick if i could like go through the entire list of disney productions that have occurred but maybe that's a an interesting conversation for later on in the show that. Yeah, because um, I was looking. But, there's actually right. some debuting that are that sound really cool too. So we definitely need to circle back to that. Yeah, it's really interesting how um, they seem to keep choosing new shows, and it, the the shows they choose to make. Sometimes I think the choices they make are kind of interesting. So we'll we'll talk more about that. But what I want to do right now is throw this to Emma, who is like our resident <laughs> our resident actor. Uh, and, and talk about <laughs> your, tell us all about you and Disney and Broadway. Yes. So I feel like Disney on Broadway has actually been a part of my childhood, really. Um, I think the first, the first I'm, well, apparently I saw Beauty and the Beast as a little kid before I could even remember, because I, let's see, would I, I don't know, would have been like, two maybe three i don't even i don't even know um <laughs> but apparently my parents took me to see beauty and the beast when i was teeny teeny tiny um and then that was one of the shows that actually kind of got me into theater when i was in elementary school and um, we did the junior version because there's a junior version for everything um thanks mti um, <laughs> as a kid and um we ended up splitting bell into four parts and i was the first one of the four um so that show has always had a near and dear place to my heart and then in high school um i actually got to be the assistant choreographer on that show my senior year so that's kind of been a formative <laughs> show for me in my life um i think the other ones that i've seen i also saw lion king on tour um that was another thing that i i was lucky to go to a high school where the arts programs were pretty prevalent so we were able to go as a group and see it at the hippodrome which is the big um touring house in baltimore um so we saw that all together uh i'm trying to think of other things i have not seen aladdin i've watched many videos of aladdin because i watched the tony awards performance and other things so i kind of feel like i know aladdin even though i haven't seen the full show um same thing i feel like i already know frozen just from watching the clips without having seen the show because apparently it's very similar to the movie um but yeah and i mean heck i just auditioned for beauty and the beast today so it's Yay. disney on broadway is still very much a part of my life and will always be um i i think i'm trying to think of other things i think i've just seen lion king i've seen it in new york as well so i've seen both 
the touring and the one that's here um, in New York City, which is where, surprise, that's where I'm at today. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, but I feel like I've always loved these musicals. I mean, I've been a Disney movie fan my entire life, so I feel like I've just kind of, the lo falling in love with those musicals has just kind of been a natural thing for me, so. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Very cool. I really hope you get it. I know. Thanks, I'll I get the positive side. For you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll it's interesting because my um I used to be really big into theater when I was younger in high school and college but we're also uh dating myself that's kind of when these musicals first started coming out so by the time I got out of college and didn't really go and see as many shows like I was super into rent in like the late 90s so I wasn't really yeah. into seeing Beauty and the Beast the musical I think I probably saw rent like 10 times between like New York Philly and Baltimore um and then just like, I mean I'm a musical like, fan in general too it's not limited to just Disney right right and I think that's the case for most people like I don't it's I don't know if I know anyone who's like just about Disney musicals and not doesn't like going to see other musicals. Um, so. But yeah, yeah so I, I, just, I never, I never got there. But, uh, but so yeah, so I, um, I had the opportunity this past weekend to go see Winnie the Pooh, the musical, which is interesting because it's, it was such a departure from what, uh, what I understand Disney musicals to be like these huge productions. Now it had the puppets, you know, a la uh, Lion King. And, and that part was, I felt kind of authentic to what I know. And I will say Finding Nemo, the musical from Animal Kingdom is like one of my favorite things in the parks ever. So I love that whole puppet kind of aspect where the puppet is really the actor and then you've got the actor behind the puppet who's like in a muted sort of outfit and you don't really get um you get them sort of acting along but you're really supposed to be focusing on the puppet but it was in a really small theater i think the theater probably fit a total of 150 maybe 200 people and they didn't even sell the whole theater because they were keeping seats open like they're and I don't think this is consistent across Broadway at all right now, now that Broadway has returned after COVID, but they didn't sell every seat to sort of leave a little bit more breathing space in the theater because of COVID. Um, but it was a really small production. Um, and I'll, I have a couple of pictures I'll, I'll throw up here to show you guys. But so you walked in and there's this cute little hundred acre wood sign, but again, it's like four feet tall and it's in this very small room. Um, but this is the the actual set of the theater that, um, it's adorable. It, it was so cute. I mean, it looks, we walked in and we were like, oh my gosh, we're in the hundred acre woods. But again, like you can kind of see the scale the of this. Um, it was at theater row, which is down. Like, oh, that's, that's where I had my senior showcase actually. Oh, yeah. there you go. So, you know, it, oh, it's cool. not a big theater. Um, yeah, I mean, there are exactly. four or five theaters in the building and it's not very big, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. but they did this amazing job. I mean, the set was adorable. Everything looked really nice. Um, they had like the little Aww. remakes of the plush. You could buy the plush um, and take them home with you mm -hmm. that were modeled after the puppets. Um, but here's did you like buy the, the plush. Um, I didn't. I almost did. I almost did. But here's this this will give you a, a and I don't know if anyone has seen any pictures of the puppets, but uh this is this is what he looks Oh my Pooh. goodness. And, <laughs> so, so, and it's weird because there's basically as as he's moving around, right? He's like harnessed to the actor and mm -hmm. there's a huge hole in the back of the puppet's head so anytime he turns you can see like his fist is in the hole in the back of, the, of winnie the pooh's oh, head that's kind of weird and like tigger was like that. slightly it was, awkward it was, just, it was just a little bit weird um but it was also like it was adorable i mean the entire show like i felt like i was watching a 
this like live action puppet version of the Disney animated film, which was really sweet. And it had some of the same scenes in it. Tigger teaching Rue to how to bounce, playing poo sticks, poo getting stuck in the honey tree. Like it had all of these sort of iconic scenes that you know from, from the book and from the movie. Um, and my favoriteest part of all, I think, was the fact that the guy who played Winnie the Pooh sounded exactly like Jim Cummings. So you felt like it felt like the movie, like it was perfect. Aww. And even the guy who played Tigger mm-hmm. and Jim Cummings has voiced Tigger as well. Uh, the guy who played Tigger equally and separately sounded just like Tigger. So it was it was really adorable. Um I definitely, I would, I would recommend seeing it. It was not an expensive ticket. I mean, Broadway tickets can run, you know, two hundred plus dollars. This was, I think, sixty. So it's not mm-hmm. quite like full on. I think it's, it's technically still considered off Broadway. It's, it's off Broadway, um, yeah. So it's a lot more affordable. Yeah, but it was absolutely adorable. And if you like Winnie the Pooh or you like Broadway and you like to see Disney productions. I certainly recommend it. I think it was, uh, it was really touching. It was actually interesting because for as kid oriented as it was, I mean, the storyline was obviously all the old Winnie the Pooh, uh, storylines. Um, it was still really enjoyable, but there surprisingly weren't a lot of children in the theater. And I don't know if that is because, um, it's still in previews and it's still early or what, but I mean, it was, we went to a two o'clock matinee and there were maybe like maybe 20 kids in the whole theater so oh that's surprising Um, that's actually um i actually do have some insight about that um that's actually more of a vaccination thing um Mm -hmm. as far as state of new york requirements right now um i was actually talking to my cousin about it earlier today uh that uh families seem a little hesitant right now to take their kids back to the theater only because Mm -hmm. of that their kids can't be fully vaccinated yet even though they're still allowed to come and you know, everyone is masked regardless in the audience, you know? So I think it's, I think it's just that as families are still a little, seem to be a little hesitant about bringing their kids back to shows right now. Well, it's it's because I go to Disney all the time, but I see kids out and about in crowds every weekend. Yeah. So that that was, really fascinating and i mean like look you go into one of the theaters i mean you can go in and see um you know the frozen sing-along or i'm beauty and the beast live on stages outside but like you go in and these theaters are packed yes you're supposed to be wearing a mask but like there are no vaccination requirements that was actually one of the most interesting parts about being in new york for me now and i mean it whether we're talking florida or before i moved down here and was in pennsylvania I never had to show my vaccine card for anything. Like it was never a requirement to go anywhere or do anything. But in New York, like you have to show it to enter any restaurant and you have to show it to enter any Broadway theater. And if you don't have it, they will turn you away. You have to show your vaccination card and your driver's license or other ID to verify that it's you. Um, And I thought that was maybe the weirdest part, but so, so all the theaters, if you are bringing a child, you can, if you are bringing a child under over 12, they have to be vaccinated because they are like, there are vaccines available for children 12 and older. But if they're under 12, they have to have um, a recent, like less than 48 hours um, negative COVID test. And so the Winnie the Pooh theater, I think knowing that there are going to be a lot of children coming to this show, they are actually offering on-site rapid results tests for children under 12 uh, so that they can be able to attend the show. But it was definitely, that was really, really interesting. Yeah, you can, somebody said in chat, you can Mm -hmm. sit outside without showing a card. That is true. You have to show it to Mm -hmm. go indoors. And I mean, it was 50 degrees in New York City, so it's starting to get a little too cold to be sitting outside and enjoying anything, especially like at night. Um, mm-hmm. But it's definitely, you could that, that, was, it's definitely that was a real surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. That makes me happy to hear, though, that they're doing the rapid testing on site. So I hope that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Sure, the bigger like Broadway houses will follow suit. Um, but that that was good to hear that like even at off Broadway, they're trying to make it as accessible for their audience demographic that they're shooting for. So 
Yay. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I feel like you can't have a Winnie the Pooh musical and not create some sort of situation that allows you to bring children under 12, because that's a lot of who that show is supposed to be for. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, actually, that I, I wish I wasn't here on a Monday because that's when shows don't happen. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, that, yeah, I, that's definitely one that just even from those pictures that you showed, Jill, that I, I would definitely recommend people to go see. And I mean, I'm always a fan of going to see off Broadway shows because usually they can take more risks uh, than mm -hmm. your you know, mainstream Broadway blockbuster musicals do. So, you know, you might see something more interesting possibly than something that you would see on, uh, on Broadway, uh, proper. So, you know, I, cause I, I saw Puffs there, which is by the way, one of the favorite, one of my favorite shows that I've ever seen. I know that's not Disney on Broadway, uh, but it's, uh, a Harry Potter spoof. I saw that at New World Stages, a venue very much like Theater Row, actually, um, has like five different theaters and, and housed in the same building. Um, but like 60 bucks for a ticket like you can't you can't beat that when it comes to seeing a show in new york so go see the show people go do it support live theater <laughs> so in terms of of your experience seeing broadway shows specifically the disney ones how how much have the shows you've seen really aligned with the movies that they're based on versus how much were their departures? Like I know mm -hmm. um, Winnie the Pooh, for example, uh, was pretty close, but there were a few deviations and I think they kind of picked and choose the little vignettes they showed. Um, but for the most part, a lot of them came either from the book or the original Disney movie. But at the same time, I don't think we see Winnie the Pooh as like, it's not so much about the, the actual film, the actual Disney animated film, whereas something like Frozen, like I know people have said the the show is incredibly close to to the storyline of the movie to the point where it's there's not really a lot of distinction. What has been your experience with that? Desi, like so, what's Aladdin um, like? For me, mm -hmm. I would say Aladdin, the probably the reason I said of the three, it's my least favorite, even though I still loved it. Like anything with the genie was amazing. Um, okay. But like Iago was a human and not just like he was played by a human, like his character was a human. And then instead of Abu, Aladdin had three best friends. So they replaced the bird with a human. They replaced the monkey with three humans. And it was just a, a little weird for me to have, you know, Aladdin and his three best friends that I've never heard of before. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, all of the songs with the genie, like I play those at least once a week because I just love listening to them. Um, Which Beauty is and the Beast. The Tony, <laughs> <laughs> the Tony Awards <laughs> ones were amazing. Um, Beauty and the Beast, I think, was the most safe the one that's probably most like the movie. Um, and then I would say that Lion King was my favorite because um, all of the songs that they added in addition to the movie just fit so seamlessly and were so beautiful that I, I can listen to that entire soundtrack on repeat and be happy with a smile on my face. And not that like the extra songs from Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin were bad, they just, you know, I thought that the ones from Lion King flowed the best. Okay. They Emma, did use human story? again from Beauty and the Beast in like the extended cut of the animated version. Yeah. Oh. Okay. When they re-released it for one of the anniversaries or something, I think on DVD they went back mm -hmm. and reanimated it. Yeah. Yes. I do remember that well, because that was also part of my childhood, was that extended cut. Um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I would say, so to me, and actually I did forget to mention this, I did do both High School Musical 1 and 2 as a kid, so I also know those uh, Disney, which believe it or not, that does count as Disney on Broadway, like, because it's not, or Disney theatricals, I should say, because uh, I think they just released 
um, High School Musical 2 as they just created the musical, released the rights for it, and were like, boom, here, schools, do this show. Huzzah. And that's that's exactly what happened. Because after, uh, that was a summer program, and after we did the first one, the second one, we did the second one the next year. And those two shows are exactly verbatim to the movie. Like, almost word for word, I'm pretty sure. If you had them side by side, they're exactly the same. So to me... The High School Musical 1 and 2, I don't know if there's a 3. I haven't looked. Somebody tell me if there's a 3 uh, that, that they did a direct to release for. Um, but, uh, yeah, hello, Jill. Um, <laughs> did you want to I'm say trying, something? I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I think Ashley's hijacking me. Um, what Sorry. I, I will say, no, it's okay. It's all good. I, I really like what they did with Beauty and the Beast, especially, and, like, that was their first one that they did out of all of them as far as that being like the the trial run per se to see if disney on broadway is really going to be a successful thing for them um i i really like the songs that they give bell and i'm glad that they gave her more because she doesn't if you think about it in the movie she doesn't actually have her own song like she sings in the opening in in bell and she sings something there um, but she doesn't, like, Home and A Change in Me are the only, like, two solo songs that they had that they added to the musical. Um, and I, I think those are, I think those are perfect. I, like, change in, A Change in Me is like, okay, it could be better. But, you know, eh. I, I still think Home is a nice addition to we as an audience actually get to see, like, how she's feeling and how she's processing and how she's going to take on this new challenge this new obstacle uh, if you will in her life um so i i really think those mesh well with the show um as far as like me not noticing that there are new songs in the show i kind of agree with you desi i think lion king does a better job as far as the seamlessness of those things but i also don't mind the surprise of like Oh, that's a new song. They, like that's that's brand new. Um, one of the things that I uh, really, and I feel like Little Mermaid's really similar as well. But one of the things that I did enjoy, and maybe I, again, I, I don't know the history of it, scenes or songs that they also wrote for the movie that might have been cut, but there is this song called "Beyond My Wildest Dreams" in the Little Mermaid musical that was actually underscoring in the part where Ariel and Eric are exploring the village together for the day. And that particular song, Beyond My Wildest Dreams, is um, while Ariel is mute, that is her, um, that's where we get to hear what's happening inside her head and her thoughts, even though no one else in the world around her on stage can hear her they just see her uh, acting this and you know noticing all these new things that she hasn't seen before um so i think that was a really cool uh twist uh something to throw into that show um and i also thought it was hilarious that they upped the key on part of your worlds why i still don't know I don't mind the higher key, but I'm like, it was already good in the original, but I think that's funny that that happens sometimes too, that they'll change the key for the singer who's going to be it, uh, originating that role, um, which Sierra Bogus Queen, anyway, that was no shade against you. You're fabulous. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say those are kind of, I mean, most of, I feel like most of the shows are pretty much the same as the films and they add in a couple new songs here and there um just because that's the thing like if you, um and i can't i don't know if this was who was talking about this during golden jamboree but um someone mentioned that a lot of the movie musicals oh, oh no this was deep in the plus this was um yeah this was rob talking about this how a lot of musicals are front loaded with or a lot of disney's movie musicals are front loaded with the songs and then the second half is where a, you have a lot more scenes and moving the plot along where you know in the second act of a musical you still need the same number of songs that you had in the first act not as many but it needs to be more well balanced so i can i can understand for the genre of 
you know, going from a movie musical to a stage musical, why they need to add those songs. Um, but I, you know, I feel like it's kind of the same formula, if you will, when it comes to uh, Disney on Broadway shows. Right. And I think the other issue that they have with uh, Broadway shows in terms of what they have to adjust to be able to adapt it to the Broadway format is a length thing. A lot of Disney movies are like an hour and a half. Some of them are a little bit less. And so to be able to kind of make it a Broadway length musical, uh, they need to put a little bit actually more content in there in order to make it long enough to be a Broadway show and to really charge the amount of money they charge for Broadway shows. Um, and that was actually, I think, probably one of the reasons that Winnie the Pooh is off Broadway as well. It's actually only, I think, 55 minutes runtime, which, you know, that's not a Broadway show. And I don't think it would really work as a Broadway show for exactly that reason. No, if it was 90... But- it could, because it could run as a one, as like a non-intermission 90 minute show. Mm-hmm. But even again, yeah. 55 is still too short. Yeah. With, right, um, with Beauty yeah. and the Beast, I remember, like, I think I watched a documentary or something. And as they were making the film, they realized all of this music just seems like a Broadway show. Like the while they were making the movie, they thought of the movie mm-hmm. as a Broadway show. So that's why it felt like such a natural progression and why I think the musicals, at least of the three that I've seen, seemed like it fit the most closely with the movie. And one one of the songs from Aladdin was actually written for the movie. Proud of Your Boy was written for the movie mm-hmm. and that was from a mm-hmm. scene that got cut. Such a good song though, wanna- that's such a I wonder if some of that has to do too with um, who the composers are. Like Tim Rice is a Broadway composer. And so I wonder if, you know, that is something that depending on who you're bringing in and composing, having composed the music for the movie, if that's kind of that whole idea of we're, we're looking at the scoring a movie like it's a Broadway show, if you get that when you have someone with that kind of experience doing the scoring of the movie. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, and I mean, you have a lot of crossover too. I mean, heck, you know, they mm-hmm. use most of Alan Menken's music from the movie and the show, and then they bring them on to, you know, write more music for the show. So I feel like that's pretty common too. And honestly, yeah. if I was that composer, like I would be protective of my intellectual property too. Like I would want to yeah. stick with that. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think Elton John still scored a lot of the music for for the Lion King on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or you can go back and have that same original person doing the additional scoring that you're putting into the Broadway musical so that it feels consistent. I think I I would imagine that you get a lot more consistency when you do that versus when you have somebody different come in and try to make songs that sound or feel like they came from the original, but they, you don't necessarily. Yeah. Exception to that rule, a show that works with a bunch of different composers, and this is, again, not a Disney on Broadway show, but Spongebob, every single song in that show is written by a different songwriter. And that is impressive how that, like, kudos to whoever arranged that show, because that is no easy feat to orchestrate all of that to make it sound like the same world. But yes, every song is written by a different songwriter in that musical, if you can believe it. I haven't seen that one. No, it's that makes been, me want to see it. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard of that one, it, but that makes me curious. So good. If I do it this summer, you all are coming to Maryland, because that is also a show that I auditioned for that I <laughs> have not heard back about yet um, and probably won't hear for a while. Um, but it is honestly like... That show gives Disney on Broadway a run for its money, if I'm being honest here, because it's really? the same, like, have those vignettes and all those things that you love from the TV show, like, it's a new plot as far as the whole overarching thing of the show, but it has all the bits, all the characters that you love, some great music, as the kids say, the whole, that cast album is a bop, it truly is, and it's just, it's just a fun <laughs> a fun show like it's it's really really well put together 
um, quick digression, and then we're going to cut to a quick commercial break. Um, but speaking of SpongeBob, on my flight home from New York, I watched a documentary about Nickelodeon. Again, uh, showing the my age here. The Orange Years. So it was if, so uh, good. Just, it was so good. If you were a kid like me who There's grew up what? watching the Orange Years of Nickelodeon, um, starting yes. with like you can't do that on television, and then you know all the Nicktoons, all the live action shows like Pete and Pete and Salute Your Shorts and Doug and Ren and Stimpy. Mm -hmm. Highly they recommend. Did. I know that's Stimpy. way off topic here, but like they kind of I've... ended with like SpongeBob sort of being the end, like the start of SpongeBob, and shows like Dora the Explorer being basically the end of like the golden years of Nickelodeon because then it became more about Which... like the commercialization of it than. Which there Which were definitely Disney weird. I thought it was weird yeah. that Disney was, because Disney owns Hulu, I thought it was weird that they were going to do this whole documentary about how great Nickelodeon was. And then at the end, I, they tied it up by saying, and this person who's responsible for all this great stuff at Nickelodeon then went to go then work at Disney. Work and Disney. like, that's yeah. why oh, they did that. it. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's kind of like, we can talk about it now because it's in the past and it basically, you know what, what Nickelodeon did. But yeah, highly recommend. If you were a Nickelodeon fan, it was an amazing movie. I loved every minute of it. Um, Me too. But with that, uh, we'll cut to commercial and we'll be right back to talk more about Disney on Broadway. Thank you all for being here. I think it's gonna be an incredible weekend. We have a lot of presentations, a lot of great musical acts. We have nothing we didn't have WDW news today. We have nothing. Everybody say jambo. Jambo. It simply means hello, hello, everybody. All right, club salute, everyone. Here we go. I get hate mail all the time. Don't move. Don't move. Ah! by unpopular demand, it's Ride Rehab Watches, exclusive to Wings. Join us every other Friday at 9 p.m. for new episodes. Fall into our televoid and watch as we all get annoyed with videos drunk from the past and references that sure don't last. Watch most things we all avoid, see classic stuff that's been destroyed. What's the worst that can go wrong? All we do is watch a lot. Garnest strangest furries, John Ritter at the seas, low budget figment, knockoff fuzzy, who's line cast and Colin Mockery, Danny K, scary puppet, Shield, Danny Arnell, the Muppets, Castle Cake, Winnie the Pooh, Tweedle Zach, Timeless Kids, yeah! This program and many more are brought to you by Wings, the WDWNT Interglobe Society. Support WDWNT to get early and exclusive access to content you can't find anywhere else, including exclusive post shows for WDW News Tonight, Park Center, and Cosmic Read Live each week, exclusive programs detailed, and our comedy riffing show, Ride Rehab Watches, access to our Discord community, and much more, with tiers starting at $2 a month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash WDWNT or visit WDWNT.com and click the Patreon link. Join Wigs and unlock even more WDWNT. Welcome to Deep in the Plus. 
Each week, join host Rob Whiteside and a panel of Disney superfans as they take a different movie or TV show from the Disney Plus catalog, tell you its history, details, give their review, and let you know if it's worth your time. Current shows, classic movies, and everything in between. Watch Deep in the Plus live Tuesday nights at 9 Eastern for new episodes. Or catch Deep in the Plus anytime on YouTube at unplanneddowntime.com. All right, we are back talking about Disney on Broadway here on Ink and Paint. And so the question I want to throw to you ladies uh, now that we're back from the break is twofold. Uh, one, what if you could go back and see any Disney Broadway show that ever existed, uh, what would you see? And two, if you could turn any other Disney IP into a Broadway show, what would you pick? Uh, so we're going to start with Ashley and see what Ashley has to say. The mute! <laughs> Sorry. Um, we'll get it someday. Um, I kind of already gave away the first half of my answer because I would, looking at the list of everything that has already been produced, Hunchback to me is probably the most appealing. Um, I've always loved the music from that movie. And I think it's probably one of the most unfortunately underrated Disney movies, especially from the 90s era. Um, but if I could go and turn any movie that currently has not been turned into one, I would go um, with our version, with the original version of Mulan. Um, because I don't know oh, why, but I think having a Broadway Mushu akin to somebody who could riff like the gene because I haven't seen Aladdin but I mean we've all seen the clips of the guy that played Aladdin on Broadway and he was fantastic even the guy at California Adventure was really great um for part of the time so if you could do something like that with Mulan and Mushu I think would be incredibly entertaining um so that that would be my personal choice because I just I think between the music and then Mushu, it would translate really well to, to Broadway. Oh, that's a very interesting choice. And not something I feel like is really kind of on the radar as something to do live action. If you, if you anybody did? saw the, like, um, Whoopi Goldberg, Walt Disney World 50th special, when they had Christina Aguilera on there, singing reflection mm -hmm. from uh mulan i, I got teary-eyed mm -hmm. yeah she was mm -hmm. so good i haven't seen it but i've heard totally, her sing it before and it's incredible insane i could totally it's... see that being turned into a broadway song mm -hmm. actually i think oh, it is already the i think they did a direct to release for mulan i feel like there's a ju at least they a released it as like a s maybe I know as far as Christina goes, her version, they released it as a single. I think it was on, like, the movie soundtrack. Yes, but um, I mean, I feel because like... Because they yeah, offered it to Mariah first, and she turned it down. And Christina got it because she was the only other one that could hit the note in the song. The high note. True. True. But I mean, like, I think they already wrote the musical. I don't think it was ever... Oh, really? Oh. But on Broadway, oh. it's already written. Because I've seen... Um, well, then I, why? No, I remember <laughs> this. I don't know. But there was some, again, summer program that I did where we did a couple things from Mulan, and I did not realize that that existed. And there was video. We saw, like, a school production. So it's a thing. I don't know if it's a junior version or if it's a full-fledged, you know, regular version of a show, but it's already there. Uh... See if Disney can help. Anyway, I'll look if somebody else wants to go. Desi, how about you? Well, I was looking at the chat to see what everybody else had said. Um, and based on some of the suggestions, I really like the idea of Hercules because I love the music from Hercules. And I think that it's another really underrated movie, um, especially the muses. Could you imagine? A whole movie yeah. where the muses narrate what's going on, that would be fantastic. 
Um, and also Newsies, I think would be really great. I, I haven't seen either of those. I would like to see them. Um, and I can't think of a movie that hasn't already been turned into a musical, but I'm just going to piggyback off of Ashley and say Mulan as well, because now that she said that, now I want that to happen. Nice. How about you, Emma? So believe it or not, there was a, an off-Broadway production of Hercules pre-pandemic that I am sad that I missed and I wish I could have seen it, but I, um, so I actually pulled up a list. This is, um, according to playbill.com, these are all of the things that are under the Disney theatrical productions. And I believe this is just what was produced on Broadway. Um, or that, cause they have playbills for them. Um, and here we go in backwards order. We have frozen Aladdin. Peter and the Starcatcher, which I did not know was them. I did see that one on tour. Um, Newsies, Sister Act, um, this show called Arcadia. Interesting. Um, the Little Mermaid, Mary Poppins, uh, Tarzan, Aida, The Lion King. Um, I don't know if this is correct, but there's a show called King David listed on here. Um, Beauty and the Beast, uh, and I, I guess these other two that uh, he owns possibly that they didn't produce but um anyway so i get i guess king david is one of those that disney theatricals now owns but they didn't produce themselves initially um anyway um of those ones on the list i honestly would have loved to have seen the original cast of <laughs> of many of them but uh Specifically, I would have liked to have seen Mary Poppins. Um, that because the tap dancing on the ceiling, uh, that the way that they did that apparently was incredible, um, and mind blowing. And I, I wish I had made a point of seeing that on Broadway. That was another show that I saw uh, yeah. at a regional theater uh, near me, only Theater Center. If any of you know where that is in Maryland, um, that and I mean, of course, Newsies. I mean, we all know how incredible that show. <laughs> that show is um but also the other show i would have liked i wish i would have seen that they produced which again not necessarily a uh wait no i guess disney did sister act is technically a disney movie which i don't think of it as that but yes yeah, um touchstone or yeah. something i think I, I i don't know uh, but uh they i guess they they own it now but um i would have liked to have seen sister act uh initially too because patina miller and how incredibly talented she is um but that is also I, I also forgot i worked on sister act not i was not in it but i was on the tech side of things for that so i know that show very well too um but yeah so many again so many good shows in in here honestly and i think the one show that i wish could be made um and again, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think with the tech that we have now these days and uh, the pup advancements in puppetry that we have, I would love to see Nightmare Before Christmas happen. And I think that would be a great seasonal show to have because, again, you could have it from, like, I mean, heck, Disney starts Halloween in August, so why not have it in New York in August, from August all the way to, to January, if you want, you know? So I, I think that would be a fantastic show to have, and I, I think those, like, hardcore stands would see it at any time of year, <laughs> not just the holidays, but I think oh, that, that's for that you for a musical. I thought of one I would like to see, just because of the Hawkeye trailer, I would like to see steve rogers the musical i don't know if anybody has seen the hawkeye trailer but it made me yeah, really want a captain america musical fair enough i need that like 1940s like from the at the beginning of the movie yeah the showgirls mm -hmm. and everything when he's doing the prom the promo stuff mm -hmm. Spangled Man. and <laughs> yep. let's make it happen Yes. <laughs> Start the petition. <laughs> oh no, Jill, Jill you're, you're muted. You're on mute. <laughs> uh, it's probably better that way. Um, so <laughs> no, my choice. <laughs> my choice for 
something I wish I had been able to see would definitely be Newsies. I was a teen when Newsies, the, the movie came out with Christian Bale and I just fell absolutely in love with it. I loved the score. I loved the story. Um, so have what being able to have seen it on, on Broadway or in a, a professional level production would have been awesome. And I'm sad that I, I never got to do that. Um, the thing that's exciting to me is that all of the things that I would like to see Disney turn into musicals are apparently all currently in development, which <laughs> excites me tremendously. Um, <laughs> Bed Knobs and Broomsticks is like a number one. I think yes. that would be such a cool, cool musical. Oh, and it's that is a, a musical good one. already. It's actually like being put on in the UK right now. And fingers crossed, it comes to Broadway at some point. But I absolutely love the music from that movie. I think it's such a fun story. It would be this great blend of like, I think they could do something really like sort of cheeky and fun with it, but still make it for kids in a way that, you know, is almost like kind of like Wicked, you know, where you've got this story that's young, but like oriented more towards young kids, but at the same time, I think has a lot for adults as well in ways that some of the other Disney movies don't necessarily. Um, and then of course, the other thing is Alice in Wonderland, like who doesn't want an Alice in Wonderland musical? Oh, I can't understand. Could you imagine the Although, set for that? It would be incredible. Yeah. So apparently it's in development. Um, and it's going to be, the thing that bums me out a tiny bit is that it's going to be based on the Tim Burton films instead of like the original animated oh. movie. But it's still, big. like, I would see that in a heartbeat. Um, I, I would have zero problem seeing that on Broadway. Um, and then it's actually interesting. There's a lot of other stuff in development as well. They've got a Jungle Book, um, Jungle Book musical in development. Uh, which apparently uh, Richard Sherman is going to write new songs for. So that in and of itself is really cool hey. and exciting that Richard Sherman is going to write some new stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so like, I think like all of this conversation after having seen Winnie the Pooh and knowing that, like, like I said, Finding Nemo in um, Animal Kingdom is kind of one of my favorite things uh, in the parks. Just, this just makes me want to go now and like, I'm excited that Disney's coming out with new musicals and it makes me want to go back to New York and see more things. Right. And and to add to your point to that, Jill, I hope, and again, I know with the current situation in entertainment that I've constantly ranted about on several programs on this network, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know, they, that they see the value in one, like, I don't know if anyone has watched any of the opening night videos of those first shows that came back to Broadway, like Hades Town, like uh, Wicked, any of those things, and just how long the applause went when the actors just entered the stage. Like people want to see live theater. People like miss mm -hmm. that in their lives. It yeah. is a necessary yeah. needed thing. And so I hope because a lot of these shows started in the park somehow or on the cruise line somehow first before they mm -hmm. were made full-fledged musicals. So I hope, Bob J. Beck, if you're listening, I hope that you see the value in this, that if you take the time to invest in entertainment in your parks, it can make you more money down the line when you turn it into a Broadway show. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I was there this past weekend uh, was the first, day that phantom came back and apparently like the theater around like the all the streets around the theater were a mob scene because people were so excited to have like one of the most classic musicals ever in the history of broadway come back the longest um, the longest running show in history still to this day is phantom yeah. of the opera <laughs> yeah but i'm i'm my friend uh who I stayed with in New York, she's a big Broadway fan. And uh, she has said she personally had the exact experience you're talking about, Emma, that going back to some of those first shows when Broadway first reopened, 
um, people were just like losing their minds with how happy they were that Broadway was back and that they could go see shows again. And I mean, for as much as, you know, we talk about, like I talked about it being really weird, the, the vaccination requirement, just because it's not something I'm used to experiencing anywhere else. Like people have zero problem, like fulfilling that requirement that whatever they need to do is worth it for them to do, to be able to go back and see shows again. Mm hmm. And honestly, mm -hmm. as an actor with how close, if you don't think about it, like you're actually really close up in those big Broadway houses. Uh, Cause everything mm -hmm. again is built vertically in New York. Like I, I, that's honestly, if that's going to be the guaranteed thing to keep people safe, then I'm all on board for it. Like I understand, yeah. you know, you do what you, you know, you people in chat, I know we might have some varying opinions about vaccination status. Like you do what you think is right for your body at the end of the day. You know, that is your choice to make. But as far as, you know, what we do is a high risk activity. And so that honestly, in this COVID world that we now live in is the only thing that's really going to guarantee, guarantee, if you will, both the audience's safety and our safety on the stage. So I appreciate yeah. those of you who are willing to jump through all those hoops and, and supporting, uh, you know, and, and supporting shows when, when you can. But uh, yeah, I'm, right, I'm but going very, how that's been handled going to see a show is a privilege it's not a right it's a privilege and you need right. to earn that privilege and not put other people at risk in the process i feel okay. like that might be like a mic drop moment on which to end <laughs> <laughs> boom totally is no i mean you're absolutely right it's like anything else nowadays if you don't want to participate in what they're asking you to do, then you don't have to do that thing. Because right. at the end of the day, it's their choice. They're doing something entertainment wise for you. They get to choose the rules in which they how they entertain. So right. Right. it's like the I mean, equivalent of no shirt, no shoes, no service. Exactly. I mean, at least there is the testing protocol as well. So you do have a second option because I know there are people who can't get vaccinated. So I'm glad that that's there mm -hmm. too. But it is, you know, not an and all be all thing, if you will. But still, I'm yeah. glad the protocol is in place. So, right. So with that, um, I will open it up to you, ladies. Anybody have any closing remarks? Any curtain calls before we uh, we wrap up the show for tonight? No, but I didn't know that junior musicals counted. So if they do, I also saw Aladdin as the junior musical um, in Honolulu. I feel so Not bad. I clearly like my only musical experience is in the parks. I feel so bad now. Like clearly, I need <laughs> what? Like I not even a non Disney that. show. We didn't no. quite talk about this. This was something that um, I so don't like, know. I lived in a small Allison. town all growing up, and we didn't have anything. Like the closest thing would have been probably Charlotte, and that was over an hour away. So not necessarily something. And it was an hour away on eighty five, which is a horrific drive for anybody that's ever had to drive eighty five in South or North Carolina. And then since we moved here, just one thing or another has always come up. So no, I haven't haven't seen anything except for what's in the parks. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that was a great segue no, okay. to something uh, um, that I believe I think it was Allison in Slack actually brought up is like how what do you guys think? Do you think that um, like Disney has pulled things from the parks mainly for their shows. Do you think they've just, or, or not so much? Like, what do you, what do you think from what you've seen I... in the parks do you carry over into the musicals or not? What I came think it's first, been... the musical or the <laughs> Hollywood studios <laughs> show for Beauty and the Beast? So going back Ooh. to Ron Logan's talk, from what I remember watching Golden Jamboree, um, what came first was Beauty and the Beast live on stage, and that was kind of what sparked his idea that Beauty and the Beast was meant to be a Broadway show. And so that's when he brought it to Michael Eisner, and then it was kind of a no or maybe at first, and then 
um, again, you'll have to, if you haven't, go buy it. It's $10 with the cold code golden. If you haven't watched Golden Jamboree, you need to see it. Honestly, it was a fantastic event. So many great panels and great entertainment. Um, but yeah, so he mentioned that like that was kind of what sparked the idea for the full-fledged Beauty and the Beast musical. Yeah, 1991 was when Live on Stage opened. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So it definitely well, they didn't pull that like to years. put it on uh, Broadway. They kept it. So. And they never, right, and they never pulled Nemo. Nemo has lived at Animal Kingdom for, or did, until COVID. <laughs> until or, until you know, very recently. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Although I'm but pretty sure I, that Lion King was on Broadway first before it was in Animal Kingdom. I think yeah. so. Although it's a very different so. show. It, yeah. Like, I think some of the costuming is similar, not exactly the same, but I think that's really the only simil like true similarity between the two shows. Yeah. But yeah. I I would be willing to bet at least that they at least pulled the concept of the puppeteering and like some of those elements from the Broadway Lion King show when they were developing Nemo for the park. Like, it almost oh, seems yeah. like kind of a symbiotic relationship between... Mm -hmm. Shows like this in the park and Broadway, like they kind of feed off of each other now that after the success of little of um, Beauty and the Beast, like well, taking elements from what they, they learned built, from from each other. Yeah, I think the reason they built Nemo at Animal Kingdom was because Beauty and the Beast and Lion King had been so successful and Animal Kingdom needed more attractions that could kind of mm -hmm. take people out of the flow of the park for a good chunk of time. So I right. think they built, they, they created Nemo in the parks. Well, because there was something there before the Nemo, was of those first few Disney. Wasn't no, there something when, there when that, Oh, was no. Nemo the first one there? I thought like Tarzan was there, was there first. I thought Tarzan was there first. Yeah, with oh, the skateboard. Tar Tarzan was in the park, but yeah. I don't think it was in that theater. That's a Tom question. Oh, maybe they <laughs> did build it. Maybe they did build that theater for it. Right, right. I think no, Tarzan, Tarzan was in that was... spot. Right, but it no, wasn't in the theater. Be. No, I... I think that might be correct. I feel like Tarzan was there, but not in that theater. But it was right because Tarzan was more of an outdoor theater. When you go back and watch the videos, right. Almost more right. Like so Tarzan was outdoors, and then they built the building. They, where yeah, Tarzan was. they built the building yeah. and debuted Nemo, which does make you wonder. As beloved as Nemo was in the parks, like they never even thought. Like again, and Jill, I hope we can still be friends. Nemo has never been my cup of tea in the parks. Love you. Didn't like. I can appreciate objectively that it was a good show, just not my cup of tea. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't Not, either. Oh, it's so like, good, though. I, just like, like from the when it's at the same like, park. I can appreciate the fact that it was a good show. The song When it's at the same me, park as Lion King, I'm sorry. Like, not to be ugly, but oh my God, go with so the much flow drove me insane. So much better it than is. Lion King. I don't understand no, people's obsession false. with Festival of the Lion King. I don't, no, I don't get Lion it. Lion King is great. There are two I'm different sorry. genres. We could have, like, a whole other hour argument. Yeah about this yeah. but i'm and sorry actually, i can Love speak you. to that from having auditioned for both of those things um it is <laughs> no, and here's like they are literally two different genres of shows because uh yeah. finding name of the musical is That's something fair. that is more like a full-fledged musical like you, those are equity contracts that they have you know it's sure. talking about full like singing dancing puppetry like whole nine yards that is a musical proper you are using music to tell the plot to tell the story to show character development yeah. that is that tr true to that genre festival of the lion king is more if i had, i wouldn't call it like a musical i call it more of like a musical review or a review kind of a show because you have different acts yeah. interspersed with different songs and it's more about the fun and the party and the spectacle and the floats and you see the characters and you hear the songs from the movies and it's a good time it is a good show but i don't consider festival of the lion king as a musical because it's that's not no. what it is no, well, and I'm just I saying of the two shows point. in Animal if, Kingdom, yeah, but if, if I, I had to pick I, one, 
I'm with Desi. If I'm there for a day and I have to pick one to go see, I'm going to Lion King before I'm going to Nemo. And again, no, sh- like objectively, great show. I can appreciate the puppetry and the artistry and the music. All great. I give props to people who did it. I understand why people enjoyed it. Just not, not my cup of tea. Sorry. But it is strange, as beloved as it was, that they never even really seemed to entertain the idea like, hey, do we build this out a little bit more and take it to Broadway? Like, especially when they were doing Finding Dory, like they never like they just set it and forget it over in that little theater. However, there is Finding Nemo Jr., they did. They do have junior rights for it. I, I have I have a list. <laughs> but again, like, that like, sense, right? like that makes more sense, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I but like you would but, think, uh, OK, yeah, they probably get money licensing it for junior. But could you imagine the money they could have made taking it to Broadway or even off? Broadway? Like, it's just weird that they never even really seem to entertain the idea of taking yeah i i feel like i feel like if disney is gonna bet money on or disney is gonna do something that's like hopefully a money make making venture i think i don't know broadway musicals are so like so risky in that regard and i don't feel like that's a thing disney does a ton of But I would disagree with that because, I mean, they couldn't get Frozen on Broadway fast enough. Like, they rushed that straight to Broadway. They sure did. All the money. And now it's gone. Yeah. That's probably because they rushed it. I have a rant about this. And here's why. (laughs) I. And I understand that they're backing Lion King still, like to this day. But my problem is, again, you are the Walt Disney Company, literally an entertainment company. And yes, of course, it's more about the shareholders and like a bank now, because that's just kind of what happens eventually to things when things become a public company, to quote Rich Grafton, who has talked about this on Pressing Issues, R.A.P. that show. Anyway, um... (laughs) But like, as far as when you when you have the ability to as a company to back to Broadway shows because there aren't many producers. I there I don't I mean I don't know about producers necessarily, so I shouldn't speak to that. But I'm there aren't many like international conglomerates that have the mm-hmm. resources to put on two Broadway shows like Disney does, and they could have. And just it was just really sad to me to see that Frozen didn't come back. Because, again, like, talk about wanting to get families back to the theater. That's a show that will bring them in for sure and bring people who maybe haven't seen that show, because I didn't get a chance to see that show, um, you know, who would like to come see it for the first time with theater reopening, you know? So, I, to me, that was a total, a total miss on, on Disney's part, uh, not bringing that show back. Now, I mean... That, I guess it's kind of a good thing for regional theaters because, hey, that means the rights are going to be released sooner than they would have been. So now, right. you know, that they make, it, make mm-hmm. it across the nation and reach more people than it might have reached if it just stayed in New York anyway. But, you know, I, that was a complete miss to me when there are still, and that, that's the thing, it's great that we're always coming back, but there are still so many actors who had shows that didn't make it, that didn't come back, at, you know, in this pandemic world. So... Yeah, shame, shame on you, Disney, a little bit for not bringing both of those shows back. Well, and you know, I'm sure there are a ton of, a ton of considerations there, not the least of which is financial, and uh, Disney is definitely. I mean, Aladdin is having issues right now because they've had a number of COVID outbreaks, so there's definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's the other thing we all need to keep in mind is that things are still kind of touchy right now. And there's a lot of um, decisions that they can make thinking they're the right thing. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's Disney's MO. Let's make a decision because we think it's the right thing. And then it turns out to be horribly wrong. So, <laughs> But also, broad, if you think about it, with how many understudies and standbys that a Broadway show has in case something happens, 
like Broadway is more prepared than anyone else in this country should somebody have to go out for COVID because you have for like a principal, you have a standby and you have an understudy. Plus you have like other like internal understudies and swings that could go in if they had to for that. Right. Standby. But how many of those people are together so that if one of them gets COVID, they all have to quarantine until they get right. tested. And, well, yeah. And therein lies the problem. But that's also yeah. why that people like it's a requirement to be vaccinated as a performer, to be employed. Like you, well, yes, you have but to... you can still, so you can. I have now known a number of people that are like per close personal friends and family who have gotten COVID despite being vaccinated. So that's not a guarantee. Right, that's of true. course. And I, again, I know that that's the thing. What we do is high risk and it's easy easy yeah. to shed virus. So I, I get it. Like I do. That is something that I still worry about <laughs> every single day when I'm, you know, going into a room to sing with other people. I, I get it. The fear is still very real. But at the, you know, yeah. it's at the same time, it's like, well, we, we also kind of, we have to do our jobs at the end of the day. And it's, you know, it, it kind of, it's going to be what it's going to be until we find this like new normal, whatever that is. And um, I honestly, in Seth Rudetsky actually talked about this, that like the business itself, like Broadway's not going to return to what it was for like, it's going to take five years and we're in year two of that five years. Um, yeah. And Oh, I think uh, so. I absolutely yeah, I think so. For like public health wise as well. I like, it's going to take a while for th us to finally find what that new normal is and how we can continue on with our, with our lives, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and I mean, yeah. that's, you know, Broadway is a very intense manifestation of that, but that's how we all basically are having to live our lives every day as it is, you know, that we're, there's going to be so many consequences for, from this for years to come that who knows when, if or when things will go back to entirely normal the way they were before. Hmm. I don't want to end it on a grim note. Um. <laughs> no. But go see a Broadway play or musical. Yes. Uh, Disney or otherwise of your choosing. Um, I feel like your Disney choices are, are there's going to be uh, exciting ones coming soon down the pike if Aladdin isn't, uh, isn't the choice for you. Um, mm -hmm. Or go see Winnie the Pooh off Broadway because it was super adorable. True. For fun though, we could, I do have a list now of all of the musicals that Disney has made MTI. And mind you, there are now kids versions of things, not just junior, but kids versions. Okay, here we go, here we go. So we have Aida and then um, uh, the school edition of Aida, um, apparently. Aladdin, Aladdin Jr. and Aladdin Kids. There is a kids version of Aladdin. I don't, again, I don't know how that's different than the junior version, but I think it's, so I think what happened was is um, junior versions of shows were actually meant for high schools to do since they're cheaper and a little shorter, but then like younger productions, like younger than high school, like middle school, elementary school started doing them and high schools were still doing the full, like full length, um, musical rather than doing the junior version. So I think they created the kids versions to be another step down from that, to make it easier for younger kids to get into theater. I think that's what that's for. Anyway, um, <laughs> we have Beauty and the Beast, uh, Beauty and the Beast Jr. Uh, Descendants, the musical, apparently they wrote and just another, again, another direct to rights for staging. Uh, Finding Nemo Jr. Freaky Friday, which by the way, uh, was a thing that happened at uh, Signature Theater, never made it to Broadway, but was intended uh, to go to, uh, um, to be a Broadway transfer. It had Heidi Blickenstaff and uh, Emma Hunton um, in the two, lead roles is the mom and the daughter. Um, and then there is a one act version of Freaky Friday. <laughs> Not a junior one act version. Uh, we have the amount closing. of time and energy that they gave to Freaky Friday makes me circle back to the question, right. why no Finding Nemo? Like, right. exactly. <laughs> or Mulan. We'll get back to that. Um, but since there's the rights for Frozen haven't been released yet, uh, there's uh, for Disney's Frozen Junior and Frozen Kids again like another 
Um, because actually the Frozen uh, Junior, the Junior version of that show is still pretty demanding. Because that was one that I was gonna do and then got canceled because of COVID. Um, uh, High School Musical on stage, which is just what they titled the movie, you know, to make it different from the movie. The there's a High School Musical Junior. And then a one act version as well of that um, High School Musical 2 on stage and High School Musical 2 Junior. Um, Hunchback, Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, The Jungle Book Kids. So apparently there's a Jungle Book musical somewhere. Um, the Lion King Experience Junior. I, anyway. What, whatever <laughs> um, that means. I, whatever that means. Sure. Um, the Little Merma Mermaid Junior. Um, Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins Jr., Moana Jr. So, who knows? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I, I can, can totally see, see them that. making a Moana. I mm -hmm. can totally oh, see Moana, yeah. So, who knows? Maybe one day we'll see that. Um, my son, Pinocchio, Geppetto's musical tale. That's a thing. What? Cool. That's I'm the longest Why? I... I that's that's a very good question. I've not read it. I'm, even if it's not very good, I want to read just to know what it is. Um, then there's my son Pinocchio Jr. So I guess that first one's a full. That's a full fledged thing. I know. Interesting. Newsies, Newsies Jr. Uh, 101 Dalmatians Kids. So they have a kids version of of that show. Um, they just okay. made it into a musical. Like Peter and the Star Catcher, uh, Tarzan, which does neither of those have a junior version, and then there's uh, Winnie the Pooh Kids. So I'm guessing oh. uh, they intend huh. to. Um, I, I don't know when that. Let, let me see. Let me click on that to see when that was a thing because now I'm curious to see if that was um, they wrote the off Broadway show and then made that, or if that's been a thing for a while. Um, let's see. That was. Um, it's not telling me a year, but it's a 30 minute version. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have a date on it, uh, on MTI's website. Not that I can see on the mobile version, but that is all of the things, uh, available wow. on MTI from Disney theatrical. It's an impressive yeah. list. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is an impressive but, list, but again, and I keep circling back to Freaky Friday. You have like four different versions of Freaky Friday. But no, Nemo, you already have everything. You have the music. Why didn't you license Nemo? I mean, I again, I'd have to read the junior version to see if there is like Big like Blue World and stuff in there. But yeah. Why I mean, they, heck, they released, a, they released a cast album of Finding Nemo the Musical. Yeah. What the, see, I don't. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's just a missed opportunity. It's fine. I mean, I th they would need to beef it up with a lot more songs and and stuff first. Like, I think if it was an off Broadway, I mean, like if they did it like like a fifty five minute something, I think it would work. But it's only like what thirty minutes at run like the runtime. It's time, thirty right? roughly in the part. But you yeah. could clearly yeah. release it as like a junior or a kids version. Like, yeah, you I mean, might. That's have what it is. Fluff it a little bit, but. All right, ladies. Well, with that, I think that will wrap up our show for tonight. We have uh, discussed all of the, the regular Broadway musicals, the junior Broadway musicals, the park <laughs> musicals. Uh, I hope it has uh, whetted your appetite for more Disney on Broadway. I know it has whetted mine. And now I want to go back and see more shows. Um. <laughs> By all means, uh, thank you all for joining us, sharing your Disney Broadway experiences in the chat. Uh, I know we've had a lot of people who are big fans of Disney on Broadway, who have auditioned for Disney on Broadway, who want to be Broadway actors. That's all exciting. Good luck to you all with that. Uh, good luck to Emma with her audition for Beauty and the Beast. That's super exciting too. And uh, I'm sure she'll keep us posted. And then when she's a famous Broadway star, we'll have her back to talk all about what it's like mm -hmm. to, to star in Disney on Broadway. All the experiences. So, if, yeah. uh, if Beauty and the Beast happens, it'll be in Miami. So for, I know we have some Miami locals. So for some of you Florida locals, uh, you know, 
I'll let you know. Oh, you I'd wanna... make that drive. I would make the drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's only like a, that's only a four hour drive for me. That's not that bad at all. Yeah. We'll have a WWNT road trip to go see Emma in. Love Canada. it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again in two weeks for our next episode of Ink and Paint. And until then, everyone have a great night and uh, a great, oh. big, beautiful tomorrow. That's, that's, I feel like I should have had some Broadway <laughs> line to end this with. And... <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> night. <laughs>